Good evening and thank you very much again for having uh, accepted. Uh, uh, good evening and uh, thank you very much for uh, having accepted my interview proposal. I'm very happy to meet you in person. I'm very happy for having this opportunity of discussing with you different uh, very important uh, contemporary topics, as for example, pain from a philosophical point of view and also disability. Um, taking into account the fact that I'm a philosophy teacher uh, as university and um, as a high school as well, so uh, as you can imagine, uh, I am working with different kind of with different categories of uh, humans, uh, teenagers, and also students, and they have uh, plenty of questions for me from an ethical point of view. And how sh how could we understand human creature, if I can call it like that, from an ethical point of view? But be before we start. To, to discuss all these kind of things which I repeat are very important to us, especially uh, taking into account the uh, times in which you are living, uh, we are living, I would be very grateful if you could uh, present yourself so that our um, listeners to discover your personality in a deeper way. Sure, thank you so much. Well, I am speaking to you today from uh, Ottawa, Canada. And where I live and work, um, I am an instructor at McMaster University in Canada. Um, and the courses that I teach are all online. Um, so McMaster is located in another city um, in Ontario. But uh, with online learning, um, it's, it makes it very easy to, 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 to do this work. So... <clears throat> First and foremost, I am a mother to two grown children. Our son, Nicholas, is 34. Um, he has multiple severe disabilities, cerebral palsy, um, accompanied by medical complexity and chronic pain. So in 2008, I decided to write a book um, that essentially is a, a philosophical memoir um, about raising a, someone with uh, chronic pain and who has uh, disabilities, including um, a mild cognitive disability. But I wanted to look at all of the programs and services that we had had where we lived in Canada and also where we lived in the UK for our son and evaluate whether or not they were helpful or harmful um, through the lens of Amartya Sen's capability approach. So I did a lot of research into the moral and human worth of someone like my son and why another taxpayer who didn't know him should pay for the support that he requires because he is a huge consumer of public funds in Canada. And he lived, we lived for about 10 years in the UK and he was a big consumer of public funds there too. So looking at the human worth of someone like our son, led me to uh, look at the justice or the injustice of pain and the treatment um, of pain in the context of disability. And I was trying to find a theory of human worth in the literature that included my son. And um, actually, the only one that I found was from Eva Kate, whose work you may know. Um, she is a retired professor of philosophy and disability from Stony Brook University. And <clears throat> essentially, in speaking about her daughter, Sesha, she came up with a theory of equality of human personhood that says we are all some mother's son. And 
she looked at that um, that very fundamental and first human relationship between the mother and the child that is the core of civil society. And she moved from there. And you know, I quote her a lot in my book. And um, and I quote conversations that she had with Peter Singer and Jeff McMahon, who would argue that my son and Eva's daughter uh, do not have human worth. They might have worth relative to a pig, for example, according to Peter Singer. So um, I think that when you have the presence of pain as an example of how, to what extent systems are going to go out of their way to help you. Pain is a very good metric, um, similar to organ transplants. If you really want to know what people consider your life to be worth, you can look at where you sit on an organ transplant list, or you can look at how people treat your pain or ignore your pain. So um, that was um, that book, which came out in 2010 and then in paperback in 2014. Um, and I continue to do a lot of work as a parent partner um, and co-investigator on a lot of research projects that relate to trauma and pain and in disability and disability parenting. So that's me. Uh, it's a um, wonderful personality that I'm having the opportunity right now to discover and I'm very grateful to God and also to our common friend Corey Carr. Um, uh, she's a wonderful person and as I said you earlier before we start before we started this record she is really an amazing and a wonderful person and so charming person with uh, such a um, deep perspective on the reality and also on life itself. Uh, yes. Having heard from you all these things, I'm thinking about uh, the dimension of pain in our life. Because uh, whether we, we like it or we don't like it, we should agree with the fact that uh, pain is an, is an essential aspect of our reality, of our life and also of our destiny. Despite of the fact that uh, generally I like to, uh, my life principle sounds like that. Uh, the promise of my destiny is freedom. And uh, I know I am uh, allocated to freedom and I have to respect my freedom and also to valorize my freedom. But uh, on the other hand, suffering as well represents uh, a way by which we have the opportunity to maybe to better worship God, to better discover God and also his plans with us and also with our destiny. But it's very hard to find a certain kind of beauty in suffering itself. As for example, Pope John Paul II, a figure I have admired a lot and he represents definitely uh, my life model, my main life model. And uh, honestly, when I have finished my philosophical studies, my bachelor degree, I have elaborated a thesis dedicated to his ethical thinking because I have I just wanted to highlight uh, the approaches of someone who hasn't been necessarily a philosopher, a qualified philosopher um, in university terms. But uh, having discovered his personality, I have read this uh, sentence that um, um, surprised me a lot. He said something like that, uh, in suffering itself, the beauty itself is the most capable of manifesting itself. What? I was wondering myself at that point, how it is possible for beauty itself to find a place in suffering? I mean, through suffering, are we really able to discover the beauty and its role in our life? And after that, having had the opportunity of meeting different personalities, different, especially different testimonies, different victims of recent history, as for example, the survivors of the Holocaust survivors or Rwanda genocide survivors. And they uh, was talking to me, they were talking to me about uh, forgiveness, about uh, kindness, about tolerance, about acceptance, despite of the fact that they were persecuted. They endured um, um, a number of sorrows 
but uh, they were capable they have been capable to forgive and also to see the beauty of their destiny and after that of course uh, i came to this conclusion conclusion yes the beauty is possible and through suffering we can discover the beauty even from a philosophical point of view because even aristotle in his metaphysics explains that we will be able to understand beauty uh, only if we are living suffering, because suffering is a test of God so that we can discover the purpose of our life, which is beauty. I mean freedom, then, and Aristotle understands freedom through happiness as a um, way of contemplate reality and also um, uh, metaphysics. So, uh, discuss, discussing this uh, topic of pain, how, um, what, uh, what should be your main philosophical understanding on this uh, life reality? How should we became, become maybe friends, if I can call it like that, with suffering and also with pain? Hmm. Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I th for one thing, I think, I think, uh, I personally think about pain and suffering as two separate things. Um, when I think about pain, I'm thinking about physical pain. And um, when I think about suffering, I think more about metaphysical pain and um, the pain of emotional pain suffering so um, I think a couple of things I you know I've just finished reading um, such a wonderful book by Dr. Joel Michael Reynolds who is professor of um, philosophy and disability at Georgetown University and he says in his book pain is calls on us with the imperative to reorient ourselves, which I thought was so interesting because um, with, with um, our son Nicholas's pain, what happened um, is that at the age of about 14, he, uh, he, we began to understand that Nicholas really, uh, because of a series of um, failed surgeries and orthopedic problems, he would probably spend the rest of his life lying in bed. He would not be nearly as mobile or active as he had been as a younger child and as we wanted him to be as a teenager and as an adult. That dream was over and we needed to reorient ourselves to Nicholas being in bed most of the time. And th that was very, very difficult to accept. And for me personally, um, I suffered because of, I thought, why did we do these surgeries that ended badly? Why, you know, did what what will happen to our son? How 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 have I failed to protect him from this destiny? And um, I remember reading an essay by David Brooks in The New York Times on suffering. And he described suffering in the way that you're talking about it. He said, that when we first begin to suffer, we find ourselves in a metaphorical basement of ourselves. We are on the basement floor. We don't think we can go any lower, but we crash through that basement and we find another basement and we stay there for a while and we think it can't get worse. I'm managing to survive at this level of suffering, but we crash through again and again, and we discover the capacities that we have to endure suffering. And from there, we begin to understand our power and to endure. And, you know, a lot of that, 
a lot of those feelings um, and that 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 essay spoke to me so much because um, in in writing that first book, I remember thinking to myself like, okay, here we are in our family. This is not good. There is a lot of pain and a lot of suffering here in our family right now. So what can we do with this? How can we be the best that we can be given the givens of the pain and suffering? What can we do with what we have? And um, we all in my family really, really looked around and figured out how to be okay, how to be better than okay. Um, and we reoriented big time. Yeah. And it was, and you know, now if you say like, tell me about your life, Donna, I will say I have a fantastic life. And, um, and so does Nicholas. He's got a great life. Um, so in some sense, um, I think, I, I, I guess I have one hesitancy, though, about singing the praises of suffering and pain too much. And that is, I think, that we should avoid suffering and pain at any, co at any cost because it is our human nature to do that. And, and in fact, in terms of Sen's capability approach, I, I, I named Nicholas's self, he said himself, I talked to him about the approach and I said, I'm writing this book, what do you think? What, what would you name as your first capability? And he said to be free from pain. On the other hand, uh, listening to you very carefully, I would say suffering is uh, another opportunity for someone, of course, if he or she is able to understand that uh, someday. But uh, it is an opportunity for any one of us uh, to become uh, more and more mature, to develop a certain kind of spiritual maturity. Because uh, generally speaking, as uh, you are saying, uh, we have this tendency to avoid suffering. We do not, we don't want to suffer. It's crazy hearing, hearing someone, yes, I want to suffer. And the Holy Father of Holy Fathers of Church, especially in Eastern Church, are talking a lot about that. Yes, suffering is a, is a big, is the highest joy for me because I want to suffer. Otherwise, I couldn't be able to understand God and His nature. But even in Catholic churches, for example, it was a saint, but I don't remember, unfortunately, his name. And I'm a little bit tired from this point of view um, in uh, remembering uh, some names. But he was a very important one. If I'm not, uh, if, if I'm not wrong, uh, Isidoro of Loyola. Uh, he was a very important uh, saint in the, in the holy tradition of Roman Catholic Church. And he, uh, um, he wanted necessarily to suffer and he prayed God to give him some suffering because he just wanted to become wiser. He suffered and after that he thanked God and he said in uh, uh, some sentences um, which were published uh, in his memories, uh, yes, I'm very happy for uh, having suffered because right, right now I'm not just only a little bit wiser, but I'm more aware of the fact that God really is really interested in me, in my destiny. So I am important for God because if I, uh, if I weren't important to him, God uh, wouldn't uh, give me all his attention. If God wants me to suffer, that means he, re he is really interested in my, uh, in my personal evolution and also in my spiritual role. So suffering, um, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge for, uh, for... Yeah, but I think that's where I draw the, the distinction between physical pain and, and suffering. I think, I think if you take family caregiving as an example, where both are present, the person, it is a terrible, terrible thing to see someone you love 
in uncontrolled pain. And I have had that experience. There is a look of pleading and desperation in the eyes of someone whose pain is not being managed properly. Um, that is never okay. That is never okay. Um, and we should all avoid that at all costs. Where, you, though, where, you know, Corey and I took, talk about this all the time, is that in family caregiving, that's a lot of which involves suffering, you can walk towards suffering and walk with someone who is suffering and suffer with them. Or you can walk away and abandon that person. You have a choice. And if you choose to abide with, to suffer with, to, to be alongside, to be a, a friend in the classical sense of the word, um, then you will have the kind of grace at the end that you are talking about. Um, and I, so I think that is, um, and I, I think that it's, it's very interesting when you talk to people who are in the thick of suffering because they're looking after an older parent or someone with Alzheimer's or someone with some chronic disease like cancer or something like that. And you say, did you know at the beginning that it was going to be like this? And most people would say, no, I, I just knew I couldn't leave. Like I knew that I, my place was here, but I didn't know. And then if you ask them, if you had known what suffering was like, would you have accepted this at the beginning? And it's interesting because you get different answers to that question. And then you ask, do you think you're a better person for doing this work? Most people that I know will say, yes, I think I am. Yeah. Consider, considering your entire experience, especially with your son, because uh, maybe a lot of persons uh, who listen to us right now would, uh, would ask this question, how it is possible for someone to accept such a destiny? But you managed, you accepted it. And now you, maybe you understand happiness uh, in some other terms, in comparison, uh, in comparison with uh, other kind of individuals, because it depends on what exactly we are understanding uh, through happiness. Because, as you know, um, all of us have different uh, different perspectives, so it's very hard to um, to speak about happiness as you, as it it is very hard to speak about life itself or world or beauty and so on. But considering your um, your experience with your son and also your activity, because you are a caregiver, and uh, it's very hard uh, to practice such a profession. But this is not a profession because, from my uh, own point of view, you have a mission, and it's a blessed mission because you um, you practice a certain kind of therapy in order to help people and also to make them understand their destiny and also their suffering and their pain. And considering all of that. How would you define life itself as a holy gift from God? Hmm. Well, I've thought about that a lot and uh, wondered whether there was any purpose in it. Um, speaking very personally now, um, I think that the holy gift from God is our, or rather, our purpose, our purpose in um, the gift of life that God has given us is to put one foot in front of the other 
and keep going. So it is to keep going, to survive and keep going the best we can. And, um, and understanding that um, this, is, this is a job that is much easier if you do believe in God. <laughs> so that you know that you're not alone in putting one foot in front of the other. There's someone who is helping you do this. And um, so for me, um, my personally, my faith has been very helpful along the way. But um, my faith has evolved a lot um, over the years. And I certainly never pray for things to happen a particular way, because personally, I don't think God rolls up his sleeves and protects babies from pain or dying. And he doesn't, uh, the way I get through life is in the belief that God is there to help me with whatever the universe sets in front of me. Um, And it is not um, God that is making bad things happen to good people. So the chaos of living things, the chaos of nature, it has, it many times can cause great obstacles and great challenges and great suffering to us, but that God is there to help us through. Um, and that our purpose is to somehow survive it. And so, yeah, I, I thought about that a lot. And I thought, okay, so if that's the case, where is the beauty? Um, and for me, and again, I, I've written about this a lot. The beauty for me is in locating the extraordinary within the ordinary. So that peeling a potato becomes a meditation that scrubbing my pots and dishes becomes a prayer that that um, seeing beauty in nature is um, spiritually healing for me that I allow that to happen that I open my heart to that um, and sometimes I need to pray to open my heart to that if I'm feeling particularly dark. So, um, again, it's God is the operating system for me, uh, but not the project manager. It's the operating system. Now let's think uh, about, uh, about this exercise of making an interpretation of the following sentence. Being uh, being happy without suffering is just an illusion, but suffering is a, the awareness of happiness. What do you say about that? Would you agree with that? Or it's just, a, I don't know, a, a personal perspective? Um. Well, I'm reminded by, you know, I suffer, therefore I am. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure that there is any um, unequivocal um, truth and an essential truth that there can be no happiness without suffering i'm i'm not sure there's true i i think there can be um pure happiness and pure bliss without suffering because you see it in babies i think that we have the capacity for both but I think you hit on something, Tudor, when you said, you know, the but to be grown up, there's something about naivete here. 
a maturity of um, the grown-up happiness, the grown-up um, peaks and valleys that we experience of happiness and despair. Um, I think it. I think most people um, understand that certainly the the valleys of suffering that we experience make the highs, the mountains, the highs of happiness more meaningful, more delicious, more spectacular. And that the highs, the experience of joy and happiness gives us hope when we're in the valley of, of suffering and despair. Because mm -hmm. We remember it. We know that it happens sometimes, you know, to be happy. So um, I gave a talk a few years ago at a palliative care conference um, at McGill University. And I was talking about living between hope and despair all the time and what that feels like. There's a lot of fear of being too despairing. There's a lot of fear of being too happy and that you kind of are walking in the middle all the time, just being afraid to feel anything. Um, that's in the context of thinking that our son might die any day, um, but today he lived. And um, He's stable, much more stable now physically than he was then. Um, but yeah, that living between hope and despair is um, a strange place to be. Um, I have to say, though, as somebody who experienced that and now is in a place of relative calm I I do feel like I have a lot more maybe control over feeling happy you know I don't I I I choose to be happy and I can, I'm successful in my choice. I am happy. And if I begin to feel like, oh, the world is against us and um, everything is terrible, I, d I have a, a really strong talk with myself and tell, me, tell myself, no. You, you know, you ignore those thoughts and feelings. And now we're going to, begin to find the path pathway towards gratitude towards love towards happiness again so i never would have been able to do that if i hadn't suffered that's for sure but i i come from a place of having experienced or at least witnessed very great suffering. And I don't wish that on anyone. No, no one ever. No, not okay. <laughs> no, you don't need to suffer that much to learn your lessons about what suffering is. You know, you don't need to nearly die. So, uh, because you are making this distinction between suffering and pain, and even from a, a philosophical point of view, uh, this difference is unfortunately ignored, but uh, you, don't, you are not doing that because you are aware of the fact that uh, they are totally two, two different realities and things. Um, and uh, when I'm thinking about pain, I'm thinking about uh, the main representative uh, of utilitarianism, uh, which has been developed, especially in UK, but uh, after that um, in the United States as well. So I'm thinking about the John Stuart Mill, but also about his father, Jeremy Bentham. They uh, were talking about the 
so-called calculation, calculation of happiness. And uh, John Stuart Mill introduced this concept of uh, um, uh, the pain transformed into happiness. He said something like that. You will discover pleasure itself when only if you only if you will leave the reality of pain, because otherwise you shouldn't you wouldn't be ever uh, capable to understand pleasure, because pleasure is just is not a superficial thing, as for example. Uh, when you are thinking about an unsatisfied pig, because uh, this term is used by him, this expression, uh, if you will be, if you live uh, the experience of uh, pleasure as an unsatisfied pig, then that means you are you know nothing about life. But if you will feel the pain, you will discover the pleasure because the pleasure is a great uh, is a great is a great price of our life. Uh, so how would you be able would uh, yes how would you be able to discover pleasure and the meaning of pleasure but the practical meaning of pleasure through pain is a pain the main instrument that determines us to discover the, ne the, ne the necessity and also the practice um, of pleasure in our life mm. well sometimes i think that you know, there is the philosophical discussion and then there is the practical discussion. And, you know, it doesn't, it's not lost on me that many of these philosophers or all of them are men. And I, I do gravitate to the disability philosophers and to women philosophers. <laughs> so, um, I think that there is certainly a there is um, a philosophical metaphor uh, of pleasure or sort of pain uh, leading to pleasure. I mean, in childbirth, for example, um, in uh, Oh, in nature, there is, um, you know, the struggle of the butterfly to escape the pupa and all of it. it it's, you know, in order to achieve pleasure and, fr and freedom, freedom is wrapped up in this, um, these ideas too. You know, there is a struggle and it is um, a physical and existential struggle involving suffering. And involving sometimes, um, oh, you know, the sense of a near-death experience um, in order to be uh, born or reborn into the light, into pleasure. Um, and there's some, like, quality of ecstasy in this idea. Uh, but, I, I, but I think when you get down to practicalities and talking about real people, real life, real suffering, real pain, um, uh, I think it's a bit dangerous actually to suggest without qualification that pain automatically leads to suffer, it leads to pleasure. I think I think of as a as a Catholic myself, um, you know, these ideas as a young girl that I had that I should, you know, whip myself in order to like the, these these are crazy ideas. And the church was right to throw them out a long time ago. Um, or that self-harm is that cutting yourself could be some way of experiencing pleasure that the pathway to pleasure is um, could be simply a pathway to, to, to pleasure, happiness, gratitude, love. I think that love is really what I'm talking about. It's the heart of everything. The heart of all pleasure is love. And um, and I think, um, you know, I think there's always some, um, there's going to always be some degree of suffering in life. Life itself 
is um, is not free of suffering. If you um, if if you if you're not suffering, you're not human. So I think that's a given. But I th- I think this idea that we sh- should be seduced by suffering in order to achieve greater pleasure is somewhat dangerous. Uh, I like uh, your this uh, last idea. I have written in uh, in a personal article uh, some years ago. Uh, suffering uh, definitely doesn't represent. Uh, uh, something that could uh, seduce us. No, not at all. Suffering is not, is not uh, the big price of our life, but suffering is an exam. I think, yes, I'm a believer. Yes, I should uh, notice that. I'm a believer, not necessarily an Orthodox believer, uh, although I belong to the Orthodox Church here in Romania where I'm living because I'm baptized as, a, as an Orthodox Christian. But I'm a believer in a large sense, because I know God is an uh, infinite reality, is an eternal reality. And I like to think he's um, eternal, if I can call it like that, in his eternity. Uh, because what we have here on us is something, uh, uh, as uh, moral philosopher, philosophers uh, in, uh, like to say, is something... Uh, which goes to end, but uh, eternity is something that uh, is a purpose of our life after this life. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, having into my uh, consciousness the presence of God, I'm thinking about the fact that um, suffering is not is, is like some, is like an entity uh, that would like to talk to me to to tell me something. And uh, this is the reason why I have noticed in my article. Yes, uh, suffering is not uh, something is a sedu- is a seduction, but suffering is a challenge, the big challenge for someone uh, who has the opportunity to become stronger in his uh, psychology, psych- psychological dimension, and also in his inner force, because suffering represents a way by which we can discover our inner world. Generally speaking. We are not so aware of our uh, of our self, of our uh, inner image, of our uh, inner force, because we d- we don't know ourselves. The biggest distance between uh, uh, the biggest uh, the biggest distance uh, in the universe is actually is actually that one from us and ourselves. And this is why suffering, this is another reason why suffering is present in this world, so that we can uh, discover ourselves in a better way. Would you be agree with such a with such an assumption, or uh, would you reject it? No, I think I do agree with that. I mean, I think um, I there's a story that I told in my book um, that that I always remember, and it was it was um, it was something that I heard on the radio. It was a story, uh, it was actually a review of a movie, and I can't remember the name of the movie, but it was a movie about um, a mother superior nun and a young novitiate nun. Um, And the the young one is complaining about having to um, scrub the pots. And she's like, this is not why I signed up to be a nun, like, what am I doing? And um, the mother superior tells her, there is meaning and there is grace in that scrubbing, so do it. And um, so I think what I'm wondering is that what, what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about suffering? Sometimes suffering is simply boredom, too. And the, 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 the ultimate looking outside of yourself for externally giving you some stimulus to feel something. And I think 
what we are talking about when we're talking about the eternal God. We're talking about grace through scrubbing pots. We're talking about the demand, the command to look inside of yourself for meaning and purpose and emotions. Um, and that that is enough. So that's what I would say about that. Uh, as you know, in the United States and also in Canada, there is a huge interest for palliative care. And uh, I also uh, had the opportunity to uh, discover different representatives uh, of this field of research, especially some physicians, uh, as for example, Dr. Daniel B. Hinshaw or Samson Ryan Nash. Uh, they are very important uh, in this field of research in the United States of America. And it's very in uh, interesting because uh, both of them, Samson Ryan Nash and Daniel B. Hinshaw, uh, are, um, they have a lot of theological approaches and uh, they, uh, they are trying to develop a certain kind of link between theology and uh, medicine in order to explain um, the role of pain and, uh, and also of suffering and the way by which these uh, two paths um, are helping uh, human, uh, human individuals to, uh, to discover uh, wisdom itself. Any, anyway, uh, I think uh, you are you practice palliative caring as well because uh, uh, as far as I know, palliative care means um, a certain kind of therapy in order to um, bring some uh, joy to someone who's suffering or uh, who's dying or who doesn't find any more uh, any kind of sense of life because he's desperate and uh, you are using different techniques, different ways through your therapy in order to help him or her. Uh, could you tell me a little bit, please, about uh, the necessity of palliative care? And um, can, us, can we also say that palliative care represents an instrument uh, by which uh, someone is suffering could better discover the beauty of life and also the kindness of God? Hmm. Well, um... First of all, palliative care is um, actually uh, an approach that kicks in um, when a patient and the family say that they no longer want to pursue a cure. That's what it is. So... A lot of there's a lot of misunderstanding about what palliative care is, um, and a lot of people when they are asked if they want to um, pursue palliative care and or hospice care, they say no. That means I'm giving up, and um, so that's not the case. Um, however. Um, if you are hypothetically a patient who has cancer, palliative care ha happens and the approach takes over when you say you don't want any more chemotherapy. You want to live the rest of your life, however long you have, with um, a life-limiting disease, accessing all the humanistic kind of care that you possibly can. So palliative care, I do a lot of work in this area with palliative care physicians and with palliative care researchers in Canada because um, we believe, of course, that elements of palliative care should be taught in medical school and in and um, that palliative care should be woven throughout the medical system. It's not like you go through the regular medical system, then that stops and you go into palliative care with a whole different team. The aspects of caring, which are embedded in the palliative care approach, should be embedded throughout all of medicine. Um, I don't know of one single human being who has a cancer diagnosis who doesn't want to feel cared for 
even when they're receiving chemotherapy and trying to achieve a cure, they still want to be cared for in that way. So like if you go into a hospice where palliative care, it's a home of palliative care, you will receive a massage, um, you'll receive reflexology um, on your feet, you'll have your hair shampooed by someone who will massage, you'll have a social worker come and pour tea with you and talk about your life. There, there are all these demonstrations of caring um, that because of efficiency, being the primary operating system of medicine as we know it today in the free world, in the Western world, um, care has been engineered out of medicine, out of healthcare, in order to achieve efficiency. And people suffering, oh my God, you talk about suffering. You know, you've just, it's day one, you've just been diagnosed by, with, with um, a serious cancer. Here, take a ticket, stand in line. Here's a ticket. Like, that's what happens now at the hospital. Um, so I think palliative care has a lot to teach everybody in healthcare and everybody in the world generally about how to look after each other and how to offer soothing, hope, belonging, love in the context of illness, serious illness. Yeah. One of the uh, philosophical concepts I love a lot is from the bottom of my heart, uh, to use a metaphor, is actually um, uh, the holy simplicity of life. Um, I'm uh, talking about it because uh, some philosophers came into my mind right now, uh, listening to you, Friedrich Nietzsche and also Friedrich Schlegel. Friedrich Schlegel, as for example, was a German idealist and uh, idealism as well, um, has been trying to develop a certain uh, kind of approach regarding uh, uh, simple things, simple details that actually could represent the main reason of happiness in our life. And uh, why am, am I talking about that? Because um, you had you had to do during your life with the most difficult cases, and uh, I'm wondering uh, if I if I was you, uh, would I have been able uh, to um, uh, to meet um, all day long these kind of cases? Because it's very difficult. It's a kind of exam not only for my consciousness but also for my uh, inner force, because I have to be very strong from a psychological psychological point of view, and I also have to be very strong from a moral point of view, because um, why not? There is a temptation in order to reject uh, God at some point, because when you are meeting um, uh, such, a, such a big suffering, uh, you start to wonder yourself by if God exists, why does he permit uh, so much, uh, so many, uh, so uh, so many sorrows in the world? But why does he permit suffering in the life of someone? Because uh, it uh, is not uh, is not fair. This is a huge injustice. But God is defined as a um, um, as someone who is who is very fair in his judgments and also in his approaches and also in his relationships. Um, he developed to uh, he developed to his. Uh, his, uh, his creatures, uh, human beings being uh, uh, God's creations now. Uh, so it's very hard to have a, a concrete understanding on suffering. But uh, as I have said earlier, um, simplicity could represent the main reason of happiness, of discovering happiness itself. Uh, and uh, I uh, I return to your uh, to your profession and also to your activity and uh, to all represents uh, your personality, your professional, your academic, and your especially your spiritual personality. Because I'm convinced you are a very spiritual. You have uh, developed a very spiritual dimension of your life and also of your approaches. I know your books, The Four Walls of My Freedom. Uh, we will be talking about it a little bit earlier. And uh, the title itself, uh, the title 
title itself uh, seems to me very interesting and also very suggestive. And we have to think about uh, to think about it uh, more and more in order to become more aware of our inner freedom, because we have the illusion of being free, free, but uh, maybe we are we are not that free as we like to believe. So, uh, returning to your uh, activity, uh, you have had uh, to do with different difficult cases, life cases, and uh, having met uh, so so much suffering, um, have you understood maybe a little uh, a little bit better the holy simplicity of life? I mean that uh, happiness uh, is pre is present in any kind of in the most simple details of life. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's um, yes. I think if if you accept that um, Joel Michael Reynolds' statement of that pain is the um, the imperative to reorient oneself, then I think um, yes. At, the, the, the there is a simplicity in abandoning the hope uh, that something outside yourself is going to come in and make everything better, change everything, uh, fulfill your dreams of um, uh, uh, remove all of this suffering somehow by magic. And the title of my book actually is is taken from a quote by Thomas Merton um, when um, he entered the uh, monastery Tom, when Thomas Merton met, entered the monastery and um, his the, his brother in the monastery closed the door on Thomas Merton's cell and he found himself alone in this cell and it was just this simple simple room um in the monastery with simple furniture and nothing on the walls he said and now i have found the four walls of my new freedom and so yes what you're saying is this simplicity but it's not just the simplicity it's the acceptance of it it's the embracing of it. It's the seeing the possibility in it of freedom. Um, and that's why I called the book what I did, because we could never leave home for so many years. I could never, ever leave the house because uh, I had a child who required 24-hour nursing care and I was always waiting for the next crisis. And um, so I found my freedom in my garden, in my kitchen, with him, with my son, with my daughter, bathing with them, holding them in bed. Um, this was reorienting myself to this simplicity that you talk about and seeing what is possible here and what, who am I in this simplicity? And, you know, it was a, it was an exploration of possibility within very limited circumstances. And I don't think very many people um, have an opportunity to experience that in today's world because we're so distracted all the time by external things. And the other thing is that when this was going on, it was before the internet. I did not have a phone. So to be truly alone, this is the, you know, with the people you love most, with no distractions. Sure, I understood. I understood very well um, um, the reason of your um, of the title of your book. Uh, 
anyway, as I have said, said earlier, um, it's very interesting to think to think about uh, the worth of my freedom and uh, the, right, the writer you have mentioned, uh, Thomas Merton. Uh, I admire him a lot because uh, his literary works represent something unique and uh, we have to uh, study his works to rediscover and also to maybe to explore a little bit more uh, his wisdom because he developed a, a real wisdom, a life wisdom in uh, his books. Especially when, uh, if we are, if we will read uh, his very interesting journal, um, uh, journal dedicated to M, <laughs> a midsummer journal of M. Uh, maybe his most uh, interesting book, uh, at least in my opinion. Uh, but um, I repeat, I'm very interested uh, in your metaphor, in the metaphor used by you this time, not by Thomas, Mer Thomas Merton, because Thomas Merton uh, uh, is a new city and you as well, you are a new city, as I am a new city and from an ontological point of view, we are unique and we can talk about a certain kind of unicity in case of any one of us. Uh, Thomas Merton has developed his uh, own freedom. You have developed your own freedom. And uh, of course, I can uh, guess uh, what was the reasons why you wanted to publish this book. And uh, there are some memories noticed in your book and uh, uh, reading them, uh, maybe we would be tempted to um, uh, think twice uh, about life before something, before saying something with uh, logics about life itself, because uh, uh, we have this tendency to define in an easy way life, suffering. But if we are reading your book, uh, maybe um, our understanding will be changed, a little bit changed, because uh, you are very unique in your approaches and you offer us another kind of perspective. And uh, you are not, you are a philosopher, but uh, not an institutional philosopher. You are a nutrition, for example, but uh, not an institutional one. Maybe you are a spiritual one, but anyway, an original one, because you are speaking from your own experience. You have developed a philosophy of life, not a philosophy, not an analytical philosophy, or, uh, I don't know, philosophy of language or philosophy of mind. Any kind of uh, philosophy can be met by us reading your book and you, reading your studies, generally speaking. Uh, so, I understand the reasons, but uh, on the other hand, re uh, publishing this book and also working on this book and reading it several times, are you sure you have discovered your inner freedom? Do you consider yourself uh, like being a free person after having published such, such a book? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, um, I th well, first of all, um, the reason that I wrote the book, because I had no intention of ever writing a book, before I had a conversation with a professor at the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland, and she and I were in conversation and I was talking about disability. I was talking about my interest then in uh, development work and in learning from poor nations in the Southern Hemisphere. What could we learn about resilience from people in India? living in great poverty, for example. I was very interested in trying to learn from development work, a new pathway forward for the disability movement in Canada. And what could we learn from simplicity, from stripping away the distractions of the contemporary Western world? And um, and she said, oh, you know, you must have heard of Amartya Sen and the capability approach. And I said, no, I've never heard. I don't know who you're talking about. And she said, oh, well, he won the Nobel Prize for economics in 1998. And she said, you're going to love this because he, he, all of his work inquires into the question, how can people have a life that they value? within circumstances of adversity. 
And I thought, oh my God, that is unbelievable. I thought, what if I took that idea and applied it to our family life and the disability experience in Canada? Maybe this inquiry makes us part of society. This, on the basis of an idea, this idea of sense, we could not be apart from society. We could be part of society because everybody wants an answer to that question. Not just us. Every single person wants a life that he or she can value and has reason to value. So I just went crazy on um, a, a passionate research journey and I went, I joined a capability group at Cambridge University. I, be, I had to do so much research in philosophy. I never took philosophy in university. And so I, I, I read papers, I read philosophy papers and just phoned, cold called the authors of those papers and said, listen, I, I'm sorry to bother you, but I really want to know what you think about my personal project of trying to position what happened in my family in philosophical and economic terms and and then choose stories that actually happen to demonstrate the points I want to make. So it wasn't just a memoir like I'm going to tell everything. I did not tell everything at all. I chose the stories that made my philosophical and economic um, arguments. And so um, that was the reason for, for writing the book. And now I feel like, do I still feel like that? Do I still think those things that I wrote in 2010? Um, I think, yeah, but life has really evolved since then, too. Um, so is there some perfect state of happiness that occurred when I wrote those things? No, and not at all. Um, but interestingly... Recently, I was a co-investigator on a research project in Canada that was looking at a therapeutic intervention for parents of children with PTSD. The parents have PTSD from parenting. They're very complex children. Many of these parents have done CPR on their kids. M many have endured really, really unthinkable um, things with, with their children. Some of the parents, um, their children have died and they are left with, with post-traumatic stress disorder. So, um, in this study, I learned so much about the role of writing my book in healing my own trauma. Um, I would say that I am much more at peace now with what happened than I was before. And incidentally, when I spoke at a huge conference in the States, um, it was like a thousand um, developmental disability pediatricians. And some of the doctors who had cared for um, our son were there in the audience. And I told the story of many painful things that had happened because of those doctors. They made it worse. And afterwards I went, I was walking down the hall after my, my talk and one of my son's doctors came up to me and she hugged me and said, I'm so sorry for all that shit you went through. And she's talking about her responsibility in making it worse for our family uh, because of a series of 
miscommunications and so forth that I explain in the book. But it it was um, very interesting, the power of storytelling to heal. I would say it has a great potential to heal. And I don't, and again, it has to be very carefully um, curated where you put experience right beside ideas in philosophy in order to make it a healing process. You can't just tell your story and expect yourself to be healed. You know, it was a process of working through ideas and emotions. A French uh, theologian, Jean-Claude Archer, he is an author French theologian, uh, speaks about the difference, the correspondence between uh, spiritual diseases and also physical diseases. And he says that um, uh, physical diseases that we might have maybe are uh, the correspondence of uh, different spiritual diseases. Uh, he gives he give some examples. Uh, I, uh, the, I, I don't want to present them right now because um, it would be a, a theological exercise and maybe we don't have time for that. But anyway, this difference is of interest to us. The correspondence between uh, spiritual diseases and also physical ones. Uh, do you agree with such an idea or it, uh, it is a rather a false idea or maybe a fantasy or an imagination? Um, what's, uh, what's the point from in your, in your opinion? It is like that or it isn't? Well, I, I don't know why people want to make the world so black and white. I think that there are both spiritual and physical diseases, and you can have both at the same time with a greater element of one than the other. The next day you wake up, the other is the greater element. I mean, I think these things are not mutually exclusive. They can be all at the same time, all mixed up together, fluid in their um ability to sort of dominate what's what do you feel most today do you feel most spiritually um sick or physically sick and that answer for most people i think is going to change on a daily basis if you have a serious disease or even if you don't have a serious disease don't all of us feel sometimes physically well but out of sorts spiritually um other days, we feel really good spiritually, but as we age, particularly, you might have arthritis, you might have something that's bothering you. Um, and depending on the day, the hour, and depending on many other factors, one will dominate, and then, and then it changes. So I don't think that, I think that suffering, if you think of it as an arc, has so many different elements in it, not just physical and spiritual. Um, there is, there. I mean, oh gosh, you know, you could do a brainstorm and name all the types of suffering that you can. It's like the Inuit people in Canada have 33 words for snow. Because they live with snow all the time. So I think there must be at least 33 words for suffering. And, you know, we just have to sit down and think about what they are. It's not just one thing or the other. So I, would, I wouldn't agree with that. Uh, maybe this is the most balanced answer I have uh, ever heard. And this is why I admire you so much, because uh, you... Um have a certain kind of equilibrium in your approaches. You have developed a certain kind of balance and um, you are not uh, um, you are not a representative of a certain kind of radicalism because you just want uh, to put in balance different aspects. And uh, as you have said earlier, you might have a certain kind of disease, but a spiritual one, which is uh, bigger than the physical one. Some other day you might have uh, a bigger um, a physical disease, but uh, there is no spiritual disease. Maybe we have uh, this tendency to become more and more um, 
obsessed with black and white because we are living in a world of uh, these two um, main directions but uh, there are uh, much more others uh, other directions like directions but uh, we are not taking uh, them into account because uh, maybe we become a little bit superficial we are and uh, the most important thing in my opinion we do not have patience and the patience, uh, the lack of patience is maybe our biggest um, enemy. When we will learn the lesson of patience in our life, we will, uh, we will understand something with this word and we, 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 will be, we will become aware of the fact that there are, um, there are plenty of realities, not just black and white. Uh, mm -hmm. Now uh, I'm thinking about uh, philosophical commissions, committees, if, uh, if it is correct in English. Um, when I was a student at the Faculty of Philosophy here in Bucharest, uh, we were studying a lot of different philosophical approaches and also the role played by different uh, ethical commissions in hospitals. Do you think that they are actually necessary in different uh, difficult cases, as for example euthanasia or uh, abortion or different uh, extreme cases of suffering and also of pain? Do, uh, do, would we need the presence of a certain kind of philosophical com commission? Mm -hmm. You mean, do are bioethicists necessary in the healthcare system and in hospitals? Yes. Yeah, I mean, yes, I think so. I think they absolutely are. I mean, I think that um, uh, should we expect healthcare providers to be... Um, to be their own um, ethicists? I, I don't think so. I think that um, what gives, I think we would paralyze clinicians, doctors, nurses with the fear of the ethical repercussions of their actions if we didn't give them the confidence that they need to act by saying, we will worry about the ethics. <laughs> um, you know, of course, um, doctors in med school t learn medical ethics and, and stuff, but the climate of um, blaming and, you, you know, what happens in the case of medical error is terrible, it's particularly in the United States where um, they are so... Um, litigious, they will try to, you know, there's just, it's a very, um, it's a society where lawyers rule, and they will sue you if you look the wrong way. So I think patients and families need guidance to make medical decisions that are very difficult too. And to, to, to as you said, somebody who has the patience to sit down with people and say, what if I do this? And what if I do that? Someone, an, a bioethicist has that, this is what is going to happen because they are trained to go down those theoretical routes and tell you what's at the end of that route. When people have no idea how to think like that, without training. So yes, I think that we need bioethicists. And do I think um, do I think that Peter Singer and people like Jeff McMahon and others who are animal rights ethicists should have a, a role in human bioethics? No. I think they should be fired from Princeton University. Uh, considering that you are a caregiver and uh, uh, maybe um, contemporary philosophical interest should be focused on uh, caregiving space, caregiving space because uh, it's more than necessary for um, uh, philosophical directions uh, uh, to, to have a really contemporary approach, not only an ancient one or an academic one. And I'm saying uh, I, mm, I'm saying these words considering uh, in the light of the fact that I'm 
I am living in an academic world. Uh, I am working in a faculty in an university, and also I am trying to uh, to be a better publisher in my own works and uh, also journals. And in the books I am trying to write, but uh, I am very aware of the fact that uh, you cannot become a real philosopher, a responsible philosopher, without uh, um, having uh, this uh, life consciousness. Because if you are, if you don't have your own life experience, it's very hard um, to have ideas, concrete ideas, on something which depends on life itself. It's very difficult because we are speaking in the light of codes, and we have so many codes and ideas in our mind because we have read a lot, and I read, I'm reading all day long because this is what I have to do. But in the same time, at the same time, I'm very aware of the fact that just reading is not enough if I uh, if I want to to become wise because wisdom is not present only in books or in journals or in magazines or in academic articles. Wisdom is present. Uh, first of all, in experience, when we are talking, you are a caregiver. But in the uh, maybe now I um, I should uh, talk to someone who is suffering a lot. That person would need a coat from my side. Uh, would uh, would need uh, to explain him what Immanuel Kant, is, for example, a German philosopher, would say about his suffering. No, he wouldn't understand something, and I, and she would say, "But you are you don't care about my suffering. You are you are talking to me about Immanuel Kant or Hegel or some other philosophers. I'm not interested in that. You you can use this philosopher for your, your own work. I'm interested in a solution. So a philosopher." has to learn to give uh, a solution. And uh, caregiving, in, um, in my opinion, um, would be an opportunity for contemporary philosophy, especially for ethical philosophy. And I'm very happy for having discovered such a field of research, and I will do all my best to promote it in Romania and to, uh, to talk about it more and more, because I repeat, it's very not necessary to uh, rebirth somehow uh, the role of philosophy in our days. Uh, but uh, talking about your professional field and uh, your entire activity, and considering that uh, today uh, we have talked about suffering and pain, do you think that these two both realities of life uh, drives us uh, to a better understanding even of the truth? Yes, um, yeah, I do. And um, I think there are two, I would call, say, proper philosophers <laughs> um, that I know personally who are writing um, from this perspective of their own life experience together with, um, uh, you know, a classical philosophical training. Um, and they're both professors. And one is Eva Kete and the other is Joel Michael Reynolds. Um, the two of them Joel's mother um, had, um, I think it was muscular sclerosis, and he has a brother also who has severe disabilities. Um, so he writes from his personal perspective, but he is, um, you know, I mean, he, his, his writing is um, very academic, um, but he, he inserts um, his own life experience in with it to illustrate the points that he's making. And Eva does this too. Um, her first, the first of her books that I read that was just absolutely, it's just one of those life changing books is called Love's Labor. Um, but you know, her most recent book, um, Lessons from My Daughter, um, is is also uh, profound philosophically and personally. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I I think that truth is at the root of this work, absolutely. And um, I'm not a philosopher, but I um, am someone who cares deeply about philosophy and is constantly seeking the truth. And I. Um, I do think that the, the many paradoxes of caring so intensively 
for someone you love. The truth is at the root of that suffering. It is. Because so much of it, as I said before, has to do with love. Love and mortality. And we run from love and mortality many times in, contempor- in the contemporary world, you know. So if you are willing to walk toward um, the suffering of someone in order to try to alleviate that suffering and you stay, you don't leave and you continue to love continue to hope, continue to suffer with um, in, in the company of someone who is in pain. Uh, yeah, there's absolutely, tr- the, there's some deep, you know, human truths at the, at the end of that experience. You'll be on the bottom floor of many basements that you did not know you had. And that's where truth is located. Yes, a very profound answer. And uh, unfortunately, I have to put you my last question for today's interview, but I'm sure there will be some other interviews if you agree, if you accept my proposal. Uh, we discussed a lot about suffering, pain, and some other um, this kind uh, of life realities. Uh, I... Um, I just want to launch uh, a little, a small uh, challenge for the end of our discussion. We should think about uh, contemporary times, different threatenings that we have to um, support our days, as for example, the war from Ukraine, uh, different uh, crises, economical crises, um, alimentary crisis, and so on. Uh, there is, there are a lot of threatenings and uh, it's very hard to handle in such situations and uh, most of the people are very scared, they don't understand what, it's, what it is really going on, how uh, would we be able to eliminate these contemporary times, this crisis. Uh, we want to return to our ancient lifestyle, but some other uh, uh, individuals uh, uh, are saying, no, we shouldn't do that because um, we need a progress and we have to live in a new world and we have to understand all this kind of suffering as a path to as a path to a new world. And there are a lot of perspectives and interpretations. But tell me, please, how should we understand the contemporary suffering, taking, taking into account all the contemporary events that we are living right now? Mm. Well... <sighs> Um, I guess I would circle back to the beginning of our discussion, which in which I mentioned, you know, putting one foot in front of the other and keeping going. Um, I think that that is our challenge to not give up not commit mass suicide, not give up. We need to continue to have babies, to have hope to continue the human race one person by person, Um, and to continue caring for each other and caring for the earth. So I think much of the truth and much of that hope and love can be found in nature. And um, so, you know, it's not a, the Japanese talk about forest bathing and um, understanding uh, the self through meditation in nature, meditating on water, clouds, fire, um, the elements of earth, and the way that earth keeps on going and keeps new, new growth is always coming, you know, in nature, even if it's COVID. Nature wants to replicate. Nature wants to grow. And so 
I think that um, that's what I would say about finding hope, happiness, purpose, um, love in the contemporary world is understanding um, that the a lot of a lot of support and energy to meet the challenge of the contemporary world is found in nature and that we need to be like nature and accept our humanity accept that we are an animal as part of with all other animals as part of the natural world that our job is to keep going keep living and taking care of each other so yeah i think i think that's it i mean i don't know whether that has any relevance to people living in ukraine right now um certainly they would i'm sure understand the fact that they're simply trying to survive and that survival is important and not giving up is important like i know that from zelensky they what they believe and so i think all of us um agree with these principles um but i th- i think that there i think your idea of the simplicity is is a great big challenge in the in the world today in a world that is not necessarily a war but simply challenged by economics uh recession inflation um climate change um the distraction of social media um whatever the anyone's you know challenges of the day happen to be that are common to many 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 people um i think those challenges yeah we we need to be simple in our approach and understand that when you pare everything else away um there's something beautiful at the core of human beings it's how, everything to do with love thank you very much for uh, your very deep responses thank you very much for uh, having given given me the opportunity of discovering your personality and also for having accepted uh, this public dialogue it was an honor for me i felt extraordinary because i have just discovered some new things not only for my research but first of all for my life because talking to you and i understand that uh, not all in this life is a, is a, is about academic is about life itself <laughs> thank you very much oh. and congratulate you for your depth and also for everything you are doing because um, you encouraging some other persons to rethink the life to rethink the values of life and also to act like life uh, would be the most precious god uh, the most precious gift that uh, someone has received during uh, during this existence during the universe because yes life is actually the reason why we should live and we should uh, never forget about it mhm thank you so much tutor what a wonderful conversation i'm so glad that uh, we had this introduction and this opportunity to share thoughts and and uh these philosophical um uh, ideas together across such a distance it's been a real privilege thank you so much thank you so much as well i wish you a lot of um, a lot a lot and also a lot of light because you need light in your activity and uh, thank you thank you for being contemporary with us thank you so much i wish you a very pleasant day thanks you too thank you goodbye bye bye